Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to yet another live stream. And I believe this is the third or fourth time the general is joining us. And for those of you who don't know, a man who doesn't really require introduction, but uh, retired General Leonard Max, former provincial commissioner of uh, police for the Western Cape. And I believe he retired in 2004 from the SAPS general, if I... 2003. 2003. 2003. Yes, and we've, we've got quite an interesting discussion on this evening, particularly with regards to what's been happening in KZN and Gauteng across five metros. And that's in relation to the response options available to government, uh, the various units involved, as well as the role of civilians and how they can essentially, through securing their own neighborhoods, take the pressure off the authorities. So, General, uh, just jumping right in, um, what what can you tell us pertaining to how these how these types of situations are generally responded to? What what the plan is, and 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 you know. How long it takes to get these these actions off the ground and and let them materialize? Yeah, Gideon. Uh, first of all, let me say that uh, let me condemn what happened, you know, in KwaZulu Natal and as well as in Johannesburg and Gauteng. It all started with uh, the Jacob Zuma court order where he was instructed to hand himself over for 15 months jail sentence. And if he don't do that on the 4th of July, then the police must arrest him before or on the 7th of July. Now on the 4th of July, as we all witnessed uh, on TV, that uh, instead of going to hand him over to uh, the police to, to, to be dealt with accordingly, he had visitors, you know, ANC structures which uh, came and visited him, breaking the the laws as with regards to uh, the lockdown, COVID-19 regulations, and some actually in uniform, I don't know what uh, formation they were, um, fired shots with automatic rivals as well. So it was a total disregard for law and order on that particular day. And on the same day, there were also threats uh, made um, by certain individuals that uh, if you touch Zuma, then, uh, you know, the country will burn and all that things. Now, according to information and according to uh, newspaper reports, the police already placed amongst those who attended the Zuma gathering, the illegal one, a police officers to monitor the situation and also to gain some uh, information as well as uh, police camera operatives who actually pretended to be media people and to take the necessary video material for any further action if possible. And at that stage, it was already clear that uh, Jacob Zuma is defiant when he didn't go and hand himself over. So already the security forces should have actually saw this um, you know, the red flags that something is going to be done and something is going to happen. Now, mm -hmm. everything builds it up after the fourth, uh, because that is now in the face that the minister and the national commissioner was actually now instructed to act before or on the seventh. And it was clear that Jacob Zuma didn't, it, uh, he did not intend to, to comply. So the mere fact that they say that he went and comply with a court order to hand him over to uh, to report to the to the correctional center that is not true. He didn't comply. His compliance date was on the fourth. He was actually arrested by his own bodyguards, who is who are police officers and stand under the instruction of the national commissioner. So and 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 took to the correctional authority or center. Now, at that time, there was already threats, uh, social media uh, clips, uh, everything, uh, you know, indicated that something is going to happen. Yeah. Now, at that particular stage, you will see uh, in video material that that evening when Jacob Zuma was about to be arrested, there was uh, a, a huge, um, you know, uh, 
show of force with vehicles as well as, as police officers because they expected some resistance uh, and when they are um, going to a resuma, but that didn't happen. At that stage, there was sufficient information available, according to me, for the police minister to request from the president and his, his counterpart in the defense minister so uh, to, to put the, the defense force on standby, um, you know, for any things uh, what, what, what might happen. But that didn't happen. And you must understand the police service um, got only 187,000 uh, members, of which about 40,000 is administrative. And a lot of them in uniform is actually administrative staff, which were actually transferred from the uh, civilian lab to the operational lab without the necessary training. So you can't really deploy those people in the field of operations, hard operations, because they are not trained for it, although they are carrying and wearing uh, military ranks. So they are left with about uh, 147. And then the majority of those people are actually deployed at station level on the 1,150 uh, police stations. Then public order police, they are, you know, uh, concentrated to very small areas in each province. Now, when you face some widespread, um, you know, uh, unrest and instability, you don't have uh, the force, you know, the, 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 the people's power actually to, to address those simultaneously effectively. Hmm. And for that reason, you could see that uh, police stations at station level was, they were also, you know, called out to situations where this unrest and, 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 and theft and uh, damage of property uh, took place. And, and they were in the, actually in the min minority. And then they faced thousands of people uh, damaging property. And um, it is also clear on the video material that some of them, when they finished their, their bullets, uh, the rubber bullets, then they just stood by and uh, let things go on. And, you know, because they can't stop a thousand, three police officers can't stop uh, two, two, three hundred people. So they were totally outnumbered at all. So at that stage, we didn't have any um, force multipliers like the defense force deployment. Now, in my view and in my experience, the defense force should have been deployed the Friday already, you know, uh, to assist the police because at that stage, from the 7th to the 9th on the Friday, it was clear that in, in the threats, taking in consideration the threats, it was clear that the damage is going to be done to property. And, and it didn't happen. The defense force was deployed a little bit late, too late. Because then uh, this damage and unrest was already in full swing, and the public order police was definitely they were definitely, you know, outnumbered at, at the various places where they were deployed, and in in, in it also appears that uh, the organization of that was not properly done, you know, the coordination and and and, and so on. Now, the police, the defense of course, once they are being deployed in terms of Section 201 of the Constitution, and once so deployed, they will possess all the powers similar to that of a police officer. And that means they've got arrest powers, arresting powers, searching powers, put up roadblocks, um, and they can seize property. But if they uh, if they can arrest or seize property, they must hand it over uh, as quick as possible uh, to the police so that they can be dealt with in terms of the law. Now, in terms of Section 20 of the Defense, Defense Act, it's, uh, it's stated that uh, once they are so deployed and possess those powers of uh, as a police officer, their responsibility is to uh, prevent crime, crime prevention, to uh, maintain law and order, 
and also to uh, protect uh, the, the 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 country from uh, from any attacks from within. So, uh, but they cannot investigate any crimes. That is a police function. And once they are there, they can they also can act in terms of the Criminal Procedure Act forty from section 40, 49, and et cetera, uh, as well as um, the Traffic uh, Road Traffic Act, the National Road Traffic Act, as well as powers in terms of section 13 of the, the South African Police Act. Now, you, 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 you can understand now that they are policemen on their own and they doesn't operate and function under the control of the police. There is a myth and a misconception about the fact when 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 the defense force is deployed that the police should be in charge. No, not at all. But in terms of the call-up order, it appears in that call-up order that they are there in support of the police. That is correct. But they don't stand under the command of the South African police service. They work together with the police to is to 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 allow the police to be effective. So, so th th there's another question I have for you, um, General. So a couple of years ago, just after the Andres Tatane incident, I believe there was significant pressure put on the police by a non-profit organization, NGO, Gun Free South Africa, and that this pressure succeeded in station level access to shotguns and ram rubber ammunition was recalled or revoked which resulted in station police officers who are the first to possibly respond to, to the initial flare-ups of public violence, being unable to respond with anything else except 9 millimeter pistols and obviously the R5 rifles with sharp point ammo, which means that there's not all that much they can do uh, unless they are trying to, to sort of exert lethal force, which is something that they're trying to avoid. Which, if, if that is in fact, if I'm getting the story correct, and you must please... Now, correct me if I'm wrong, that, that was a massive blow to the ability for, for the police to rapidly react to public violence because that infers that not much can be done until the public order police units arrive on scene with their equipment. Yes, that's correct. You know, uh, let me take it from the Marikana incident. The Marikana Judicial Commission, um, you know, recommended or you can say actually instructed that no uh, sharp point and deadly um, ammunition must be used or even be present in automatic rifles in, during the deployment of police in dealing with uh, riots, unrest. That is the one thing. And it was requested in that report that a panel of experts should be put together and make recommendations to uh, the police in terms of dealing with public unrest. Now, the panel of experts report became available about two months ago, where it was uh, launched by the Minister of Police, Mr. Becky Kalen. And uh, in that report, because I use it as part of my studies, uh, it is very clear that the police should not use R5s or automatic uh, rifles, uh, fully automatic rifles, but rather uh, non-lethal bullets um, with reference to uh, the, the rubber bullets. Now, it's not only the police, but let me finish to say that once, whilst I was watching this uh, TV program with regards to this unrest, uh, the reporter, uh, of CENCA at, uh, in Johannesburg mentioned that the police told them they don't have any ammunition, their rubber bullets are finished, all they got is this empty shotgun and their nine millimeters. And as a result, people were actually committed crime in their presence because there's no way that they could actually prevent them because they didn't have the right tools. Now, in, in terms of the deployment of... of um, the uh, the defense force once the defense force has been deployed the defense force for that particular policing function should also be issued 
with the relevant instruments to execute a policing function, not a war a function, but a policing function, because in terms of the act, it, is, it states very clearly they are, they are occupying now and possessing the, the powers of a police officer, and they are equal. The one is not inferior to the other one and doesn't stand on the orders of the other one. So um, they must also, but they are issued with our fours or our five rifles, and that is live ammunition, which is not conducive. That is contrary to the recommendations of the Falem uh, Marikana Commission, as well as the, uh, the report of the panel of experts. So that is a problem. So I hope that out of this whole exercise, that the police, and I will deal with it at the later stage, will review their deployment. Because there's also allegations that these guys were deployed they didn't get food and they didn't get any backup ammunition to fill up their, their stock, you understand? And they are left there, you know, alone to fight for themselves. So once they put themselves in a situation where they have to defend themselves because their lives are at risk, then obviously they're going to use their nine moles um, to defend uh, their, their, themselves. But... <clears throat> Yeah, that, that is ultimately a, a, a problem at this particular stage. But uh, let me say that once you look at the deployment of, of when the, the National Defense Force actually joined the, the SEPs at grassroots level, um, there were no coordination. There's no roadblocks. They could have done that if there was proper co uh, cooperation, prevent people to take away uh, the, the property from the shops, you know. Nothing, they were just standing there in between. But now you must also understand there's certain laws and regulations of which the police officers have to comply with. And that is that the instruction one of 2016 make it very clear, um, paragraph 85 of that national instruction that um, no life will be taken and shall be taken um, when property is damaged to defend property, irrespective of the value of the property. But contrary to that, Section 3 of the Constitution states very clearly the duties of the police is to protect life of the citizens and their property. So there is a bit of conflict. The Constitution uh, was not amended to, to, to erase that part where the property is, 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 is concerned. Now, in, 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 it is also equally important that <clears throat> you must understand that they commit crime in the presence of the police. Now, there's a case they call it uh, the Minister of Police versus uh, Evils, where it was uh, stated very clearly that the law put a positive uh, obligation on, on, on government to protect property and to protect life. And if a crime is committed in their presence and the individual uh, maybe uh, uh, was injured, assaulted, or, you know, experienced damage to the property or, or lost, then obviously that individual got a civil action against the, the government uh, for not actually acting when the law actually obliged them to do so. So if you look at this particular situation, Minister Glodlo, the Minister of uh, uh, State Security, she made it plain yesterday at the press conference that they had information and they passed it on to the Minister of Police. The Minister of Police didn't deny this. He didn't say they didn't receive it or they did receive it. He didn't deny it. Now, once, if she said that she passes on the, the department passes it on to the client, or the client is obviously the police, and there was a delay, maybe an unnecessary delay, an unjustified delay, and it, it, it causes the damage, you know, subsequent to that delay, this damage was caused by the perpetrators. 
Now, somebody must be held uh, accountable. Some heads needs to be rolled. It needs to roll because um, the, the government, in terms of the constitution, is responsible to protect the citizens' lives and their property in terms of the act. And if there was an unjustified delay, then obviously uh, I am the view, and that is also I appreciate the fact that Action SA is going forward now uh, with a class action, uh, you know, for the damage of uh, which happened and took place at the various places, and they invited uh, uh, victims of of that particular unrest to join them in the class action, and they are prepared to to deal with the legal cost. But that was not done before. Uh, there's no uh, 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 record that it was done before. But the thing is, is it's not a case of it should have been done before to allow you to institute it. This is a fact of let us test whether government comply with its constitutional obligations. And if not, if government's delay was unjustified to act properly, not only act, but properly, once they experience these red flags and threats, why didn't they at that particular time, you know, deploy sufficient uh, defense uh, uh, force uh, people uh, to prevent the burning of about 70 um, trucks, uh, how many shops destroy, factories destroy, uh, people tens of millions of people. rats. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's about 72 people got killed in the process. So obviously, that will be, I'm, I'm looking forward that for them to actually go forward, not because I've got anything against the state or anything against an uh, individual. What is important here is you can't only, I, I disagree with people who says no, the place where to keep government of, uh, 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 responsible and accountable is parliament. That is, that is a myth. Some ministers don't even pitch in parliament. They don't, exactly. even answer, they don't even answer questions in parliament. So that is one place where you can only put words. They don't move them. But once you take them to court, the court make a judgment. And if it is in your favor, then obviously they got remedies to appeal it or not. But I think this, is a, this, this thing is going to turn into a constitutional court decision to determine if government lack in acting uh, and, and was neglected and uh, ne negligent uh, and not uh, act timely on the information at their disposal. Yep. And, and, and it causes yep. damage to, to innocent citizens of this country which they are responsible to protect. Obviously, there will be a judgment and that judgment can be used uh, for future cases, and that will keep government on its toes. You know, there's an, some some ministers got an attitude of, um, you know, they are God of Africa. You must jump when you see them or whatever. It's just the other way around. We are not in service of the ministers. The ministers are in service of the public. Exactly. And people must understand that. And ministers must understand that that they are not God. When they come, they are our servants because we vote them and then they get paid by taxpayers' money. You understand? So the thing is, that case, uh, for instance, for example, this case of the EFF versus the National Assembly, there was never in the past a case like that. Never. You know, as legal history, this president created, this president created, because there's always a first time where you challenge the authority of, of government and you try to keep them accountable. Parliament per se is not the place where it is effectively done. There's a lot of words to say, there's a lot of speeches to be made, but there's no difference outside. And the only way that you will see a difference outside is when you take them to court, to the court compel them to act in accordance with the constitution. You, you understand this constitution, this constitution is just a, a book with uh, about 189 pages. 
and there's nothing. I can put it in the water, I can put it in the, in, in the fire. It's just a piece of paper. But this content of this paper, of this book, was tested with the Jacob Zuma uh, court order. Yes, so big time. To prove, uh, to prove to us whether this is a living document and whether this document is protecting our rights. And the mere fact that uh, uh, Jacob Zuma was actually ultimately uh, arrested and placed in, uh, in, 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 in prison um, assured us that this document, um, you know, got value, got value, and it direct us. Because if government didn't act in accordance with the court order, then we could have teared up this document when because it was of no value then. And and, and that is a, an interesting point when, when we talk about, you know, the constitution doesn't give us rights, it protects rights, because there are many people who, who don't quite understand that. But this inaction by government, this failure to act on the intelligence, this failure to interpret the intelligence, you know, whether that's through incompetence or, or malice, we'll probably still find out. But whatever whatever the reasons there were ordinary citizens that were left with a huge vacuum of safety and security as the authorities just did not have the resources to respond to the mass outbreak and these citizens took up their own guns they they went via their existing cpf neighborhood watch structures they communicated they shared resources they shared, shared information with the authorities they cooperated with the authorities but in most cases that involved the police saying you are on your own we, we can't help you do what you need and uh, to stay safe and we'll get back to you in about 72 hours which in many cases happened and and in most cases i'm aware of at least three communities where the guys gave their personal ammunition to the police because the police had run out of line mall and the only thing that kept them going so that they could protect their neighborhoods is that they could re legally reload their own ammunition with reloading presses in their homes it was it, harrowing stories came out of this and I still, a couple of years ago, I said that a, a well-trained, disciplined, and well-armed civilian population is a national security asset, not a liability. I believe Ronald Noble, who was the, the, one of the previous Secretary Generals of Interpol, said something similar, but I'm not going to try to paraphrase him. And this is an asset that that government, if it were a responsible government, could tap into and use as a sort of informal reservist population group. We all, well, you and I both know, General, what happened to the real reservists and that it declined by about 85% due to mismanagement. Um, many people are seeing the truth to this. Beiki Tele doesn't seem to, to like the fact that ordinary citizens managed to secure their, their own homes and neighborhoods. In your, in your opinion, how do normal people, ordinary citizens, fit into this, this vacuum of safety and security and, and how can they make a difference? Yes, uh, let me first say, you know, uh, government's uh, priorities are wrong. We had before this, and currently, 58 people killed on a daily basis. And that is increasing. It was 57 and increased to 58. It, can't even, it can even be more, because this crime sense is not 100%. You know, it's a more or less, more or less, 100%, but not 100%. While this crime was increasing and uh, people died at 58 at, uh, on a day, not even in a war situation at the moment, and you experience your cash and transit robberies, business robberies, and so forth, the government cut the budget of the South African police service. I cannot believe it. And, and it then was they a massive expect, cut. Yeah, and then they expect the National Commissioner of Police, uh, General uh, Sitole, Kesla Sitole, to serve with 140,000 people, um, actually operational, uh, 58 million. It is impossible. It's an impossible task to do it properly. Similar to the warm bodies, the equipment, as you pointed out, is also a problem. They don't have it, and I alluded to, earlier, to it earlier on. 
they don't have the, the necessary equipment and ammunition to do, their, to do their job and to protect lives of the people. Now, in other words, if government is not properly resourced to protect the lives of the people, then the people should do what they are supposed to do. They don't have a choice. They are forced into the situations where we had now experienced, as they call it, vigilante groups, who actually are desperately trying to protect their livelihood as well as uh, the families' lives and their suburbs not to be burned down to ashes. Now, you can't blame them. Now, we've got neighborhood watches. In the Western Cape, um, it was well organized and it's still in place where neighborhood watches were coordinated with the police, proper coordination, and we didn't experience any of these type of unrest which we saw in uh, KwaZulu-Natal as well as in Pretoria. But coming to the communities, the police, police with a community mandate, and if the police are not in a position to protect themselves, obviously it is their right to, to protect themselves, to form groups and to protect themselves. And for that particular reason, as, as much as you, you, you find um, your farm watches, your farm watches, now farm watches uh, and security guards uh, companies are well organized structures as well as your neighborhood watches. But apart from that, this thing causes communities to, to on an ad hoc basis, impulsively form groups to protect each other and to protect their property. Now, there might be accusations and, and, and um, uh, instances where they might maybe breach the law uh, for the one or other reason, but that needs to be investigated and proved in court if it is the case. But you cannot stop communities to protect themselves if the government is not in a position to do so. And that is a constitutional responsibility of government to protect, is an, actually a first responsibility because there cannot be a government if they, if the people are all dead. Yeah. The, the government govern the people and the people choose the government of the day. So then we come to this firearm thing, which is a, you know, a picky pay at the moment. Yeah. Um, no, you can imagine, Gideon, if all our firearms and, uh, you know, were taken by government, which uh, Minister Becky Kelly intended to do, it was a bloodbath in certain areas. You know, the people who were left on their own as sitting ducks without any proper defense weapon to save their own lives and their properties. I mean, we don't deserve this type of treatment. No. And I hope that the minister reconsider that particular amendment bill uh, in the light of what happened now. And, uh, and we need um, our firearms to protect ourselves. Without our firearms, you can imagine, although there's an accusation that people are being targeted, uh, you know, because of firearms, uh, and so forth, and at farms, they look for the firearms. Now, you can imagine if a farmer doesn't have a firearm, they are isolated. They are not where they can hire, but, uh, for instance, here, uh, I've got, for instance, uh, arm, arm response, you know, within yeah. three minutes, they, they, they will attend uh, to my uh, alarm. But in, in, uh, on the farms, it's definitely, farms are... Um, kilometers away from each other and the farm watchers uh, have to drive when they get an alarm you understand it takes time and exactly. they need to protect themselves because they are there to provide for us uh you know food for south africa and if they are being murdered then it if, don't affect only the the farmer it affects the, the farmer's workforce as well and those people will then migrate from the rural areas to the cities where they are not trained for the job market in the city. And what happens? Your crime is going to escalate. Yeah. So if you protect your farmers, you protect uh, jobs as well, because your farming community is one of the biggest employers 
uh, of, of people in South Africa. And it's one of the few employers during this entire economic contraction due to lockdown that actually expanded employment and started uh, hiring more people than, than, than there were layoffs. Um, th the other interesting point about this is there were a lot of horror stories that were that were circulated about you know these these self defense civilian units these neighborhood watches these armed groups it would be a complete bloodbath now there have been many 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 people actively protecting malls hospitals their neighborhoods lots of shooting around Durban and Gauteng and Soweto and everyone was involved it was black white colored Indian taxi bosses were there helping to try and restore order. Stolen goods were recovered by civilians. Again, lots of shooting. No one, no dead bodies in the street. No massacres. No, none of this. None of this hyperbolic nonsense that we were told was going to be a result. Because for the most part, by one or two regrettable incidents, the civilians actually conducted themselves with discipline and decorum. And I think they understood what they were doing, and nobody wanted to cause a bloodbath. Which means that this mythology that we're all irresponsible, trigger happy hooligans that just want to kill people that myth is busted um i mean that's uh, that's an, a nonsense story um your thoughts on that general before we come to a very uh, there was a very important point that you brought up with me that you'd like to discuss but before we get to that just just your opinion no it is you know um if you take the taxi environment the taxi fraternity the taxi fraternity is known for taxi killings, you know, because of the competition for routes. They astound me in the way that they acted now. They realize that Same. this... I was blown away. <laughs> yeah. So, so, you know, they actually came forward and say, not in our name. We are going to protect these malls because it is our income. These guys are destroying our livelihood. And, and those of others, because if there's no mall, people are not going to go to the mall, you know, and that affect their business. So the, 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 the thing is they even, <laughs> I saw on television, they branded firearms and, and the people were more disciplined when they act than, and when, as when the police ordered them to, 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 to do something. So, uh, so they came to, to the fore and showed that uh, they are not those hooligans which we uh, portray them in certain instances and, and mur mass murderers of, 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 of competition, but also people with dignity, people with uh, interest in uh, the economy of the country and, 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 and want a peaceful solution and a peaceful environment to, for them actually to, to do business. So, yes, um, the communities, you know, uh, play a huge role. And you know, the, the thing is, and in my view, and it is what I always say, and that is the police can only stabilize a situation. The normalization of a situation is within that community. And we already see, saw this morning, how uh, the community of Johannesburg jumped in and they didn't wait for government to clean up. They want to normalize the situation themselves. And that actually, confirms my viewpoint that the normalization lies in the community and not necessarily um, in, with the police or any other um, law enforcement uh, uh, structure. They only stabilize it. Normalization is with the community. And uh, I would like to commend those communities who took the initiative, you know, and I hope, you know, let me quickly go back. Minister Blodo says that they diverted a huge disaster to South Africa. Now, I read in the papers there, there were people who intended to uh, damage the infrastructure of the country. And uh, now obviously, the minister, uh, Zizi Godwa, the deputy minister of intelligence, he was very serious when he says on television yesterday or today that they know of the people who try to do this because that is uh, Mukonto, where uh, uh, you know, strategies which they executed. Now, if they know who they are, so obviously, and, and, and I believe there's one been arrested and they are on the tracks of the others. I would like to see who are they and that they are going to be dealt with according to the law. 
And you know, the other thing is there's about, um, I said, no, 2,000 or something uh, of, of the people arrested for this looting. Now, my experience is now in South Africa that they burn uh, universities, they burn property. Then the police arrest these people. And after a couple of months, the cases have been withdrawn. Yeah. So there's no deterrent. There's no... You, you, there's you know, no prosecution or consequences. Yeah. Exactly. You, 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 you understand? There's no consequences for these things. So I, I want to see what happened to these guys, these people who were arrested and charged, whether those cases will go in and out or are they also going to be withdrawn? Then we will... That is a motivation for people to, to you know, to get involved in, in crimes like this. No, that is that's exactly it. And I suppose uh, a very important question is, is General, if if you were in charge of the security structures, what would you change or what would you do in order to prevent similar uh, a similar sort of situation happening in the future? And the reason I ask is. If we look at the consequences of 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 this this particular uh, mass destructive social uprising, it is going to cause severe economic consequences. There will be social consequences. There will be a lack of resources pertaining to food, clean water, electricity, all these things. There is the potential for this to happen again. Um, I mean, I think we would be foolish to discount that. What what do you think needs to be done in order to to mitigate and prevent? Yeah, you, you you see the thing is that um, this minister, deputy minister Zizi Godwa, he said that there were there are guys in the uh, security agency who actually behind this, you know, the people who are supposed to gain the the information to protect the country is actually planning, use information and planning and to destroy the country. So that is now the cater deployment which is happening, you know, in the, the ANC deployment policy. And those cadres is not focusing on the interests of the country. They are aligning themselves with a particular faction and they are actually promoting the interests of that particular faction. And that is why we are sitting with this problem at this point in time. Uh, people deployed in those instances on in this, yeah, on in, in those um, departments should be apolitical, not, uh, you know, express loyalty to a particular political party, but loyalty to the constitution and loyalty to the country and its people. That is the one thing. It means that you have to review that whole structure and employ people, which is officials, not politicians. Uh, you know, uh, and there's a big difference. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. So they they are officials, and we have heard in the uh, it was before the Zonda Commission uh, about the malfeasance which uh, happened in the State Security Agency. You know, which is um, I don't have hair, but my hair was raising uh, to think that people who got access to you your personal details and you've got the right to, uh, you know, um, interfere with your constitutional right of privacy uh, uh, and, and so forth, um, can act in, in that particular manner. That is the one thing. The other thing is, if I saw in, in the papers this morning in the news, on News 24, that uh, the National Defense Force uh, called up their reservists. Now, I would like to propose to government to use those reserves as a national uh, force, a national, um, uh, yeah, a national force, you know, like America, they've got this uh, uh, national force, which they deploy all over uh, America if there's a, a problem. Yeah, the National and Guard, essentially. A guard, they say guard, that guard, the National Guard actually. So the National Guard, and they train them. Uh, firstly, first priority is to defend the country, but let them focus then on, on, on inland you know, deployment, 
like in terms of Section 20, where they will possess the, the powers of, uh, of police officers and do that function. So, and then you, you, ex you, 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 you conduct exercises, um, you know, regular exercises with them. And once anything of this nature is being sensed, what is going to happen or, you know, then obviously call up your reservists. You don't have to take your frontline um, soldiers for this particular function. And that uh, uh, National Guard, which is then situated in the, the National Defense Force, they will complement public order police and that will allow your station police officers to continue with their day-to-day -day policing for the other crimes which they uh, have to attend to. So you don't take your, your station resources away and to attend to something the people is not regularly trained in, don't have the necessary equipment to, to conduct the service, uh, the particular render that particular service and they endanger themselves because they are not equipped. So that is one of the things. The other thing is to strengthen your reserve, reserve service. You know, uh, it is so depleted the reserve system to increase your Thanks. reserve system. Yeah, and train them also in riot control. You, you train them, you train them. You know, the priorities must just be aligned in, in, in the South African police service and the security service of this country. You train your reservists. There's a national guard which is situated with a with a with a with a defense force. They are trained and exercises uh, regular exercises and equipped with the necessary tools for that particular purpose, as well as your reserve services. If there is, uh, they are deployed for crime prevention in general. But once there is unrest. You call up your reservists because they are trained in crowd control as well, and they are being deployed under the command of public order as a force multiplier. So the options are there. There's only think out of the box. The options are there. So, you know, the tunnel vision approach, we have to get rid of it. And There are know, so many vision. workable solutions yes. that will not Precisely. destroy the budget exactly. Precisely. Um, then you were uh, okay I, I mentioned that then you've got also your your farm your farm watches and you've got your security companies your private security companies now private security is already most of them are armed security armed there should be a better coordination between police and private security. Yes, and there, absolutely. And there, and there should be in each province a provincial body of private security who would represent them on a national level. So besides CIRA, who actually do the administration, I belonged also with my company to CIRA, but that is also the administration, the code of conduct and, 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 and so forth. But the operational things where you serve as a force multiplier to the South African Police Service, who is the prime crime prevention unit in our country, and who've got the ultimate responsibility to protect our citizens, that you, in cooperation with them, are being deployed. And there's a proper coordination and you block all loopholes possible you know, um, to do that, as well as your, your, your farm watches. You know, in terms of Section 47, I think, if I'm not mistaken, of the Criminal Procedure Act, a police officer can instruct any person from the age of 60 to the age of 60 to assist him or her yes. to do the job. And if they fail, they are guilty of an offence and punishable. Now, once you've got this structures properly vetted, who works with the police, because you've got also this rogue uh, security companies who got ulterior motives and is vetted properly, and uh, you can instruct an issue, you can uh, issue an instruction to say, we, I, we place the following companies on duty. On duty, then they can 
you understand besides the 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 civilian power of 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 arrest um you give them the extra protection um you know and coordination in assisting the police uh you know to to address this particular issues it's 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 a form of almost depu deputization so besides you're taking you're taking people who are already re registered as security officers. They have the equipment, they have the tools, they have the training, and you are using them as an auxiliary, which is absolutely brilliant idea. And, th and thank you so much to everyone for their super chats tonight. The general is, is a wonderful guest, and, and, and we, we have him here regularly. While, while we've got the viewership, if you want to do something to stop the government from disarming good, ordinary, law-abiding citizens of their guns please go to the Dear South Africa website. It's a public participation website. There is a section there that allows you to comment on the proposed Firearms Control Act Amendment Bill. Please click on that. Go give your comments. You can even click through it without having to write massive sentences. It'll take you five minutes. Please go there and say you reject the entire bill or you oppose the bill in its entirety. That will make a huge difference. Sorry, with that commercial break out the way, Dear South Africa, by the way, Google it. Um, that's that's exactly it, General. These solutions are we, we have possibly per capita the largest private security industry in the world. The, the, it's absolutely stupid to not use it for this purpose. Yeah, yes, I, I totally agree with you. And uh, let me talk about uh, the ratio of police versus community. The ratio with the police apply at the moment is, in my view, totally wrong. For instance, they will take. Say for, say for, for argument's sake, the Western Cape got a population of 6.2 million. Make it 6.5 million. Then the, then the police will, will count those who are stationed in the police in the Western Cape, plus the people who's working at uh, your, the, the, what you call it, uh, the forensics, forensics units here, here next to me in Plata Yep. <laughs> uh, the forensic units, yes. And uh, those uh, finger fingerprint units, who's not in the line function, they are administrative people. And then also those people who's been deployed from other provinces for a particular period of three months or so in the Western Cape. Then they, they take all those numbers and then they divide it with 6.5. And they say, no, it's about 380 uh, office, uh, uh, people per officer. No, that is not true let me tell you that yeah. the ratio of a pol uh, of the police should be done in the following way and that is you take a police uh, station precinct then you count the population in that precinct and then you take into account the difficulty of the policing environment there like your checks and all that stuff and in accordance with that information you determine the strength of that police station and resource the police station in terms of their own population because what happens now is with that old uh, ratio uh, system it shows 3.8 but in kailicha or in makasa it is one policeman for the, a thousand five hundred people. Yeah. You you understand? Because the range is not being determined on the police precinct, but on the on the, on the, on, the, on, the, on the whole province of the population. So so if you do that, Gideon, that, and you and you uh, subtract uh, your your admin people, those in the in the offices from from your um, determination of the ratio, and you take your your GDS, your community service center, your and your patrols and your detectives, and you count that in only them, because those are the people who's out there in the community, and who are actually you know uh, facing the gangsters and uh, must attend to to the to the um, to the complaints. Now, we all complain that the police is always late and it's after the fact uh, they appear on, 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 the, on the scenes and they are not in time. And that is one of the reasons why 
The survey on uh, victims of crime survey in 2018 indicated that the police, trust in the police is about 54%. Yeah. And one of the things they are re readily available, they are corrupt and they are lazy. Now, you know, if you were actually, you know, on the patrol van and you see for yourself and experience yourself, how these people really chase from the one with that van they are driving the whole night from the one complaint to the next complaint. You know, when the shift takes over, there's a clipboard full of complaints, you know, which they have to carry over because they don't have uh, the, the resources, the, the warm bodies. Now, the police, in my view, in South Africa, to have a meaningful impact, impact uh, in our communities and on crime prevention, not crime detection, but crime prevention. Prevent. You know, the success of the police, let me, let me explain this. The success of police is not necessarily how much people you have arrested for crimes already committed and for which you got already victims of crime. Exactly. The ultimate measurement of the success of the police is the absence of crime. The absence of crime is determined by Precisely. I wish more people understood that. It's not yeah. a metric. It, the, you can't have a performance metric of X amount of arrests or, or silly things like that. It is purely the absence of crime. Precisely. Absence. So at this point, as we speak, private security employed, private security is 534,000 strong employed. The police are 187 and 140 is operational. We need at least 300,000 police officers in South Africa as a start. And you cannot, you cannot take away from the budget of your frontline institution to protect lives for the SAA. You cannot do that. In, other words, yeah. in other words, you don't regard the importance of your citizen's life as a priority, but as a secondary to other institutions, which is taking our taxpayers' money years in and year I, I, out. I was about to say, it's a secondary concern to a business class yeah. ticket to, to London, or even between exactly. Cape Town and Joburg. That's really it. And you know, and you know, Gideon, I'm saying this, not because I've got uh, some uh, as they say in Afrikaans, a belgi to sleep with the month. No, I, I don't say it. I don't do this. I'm talking to you as a concerned citizen and as a former general, operational general in the South African Police Service who loves the South African Police Service. And I want the National Commissioner to be successful because ultimately he is charged with a very important responsibility, and that is to protect lives. You know, you know, the thing is, if you take what happened to the police in the past, with all this employment as national commissioners who doesn't have a clue of what this policing, it was Jackie Zalebi, Becky Kelly, and Ria Peja. Now, <clears throat> And the police is the front line, the front line. It means the police is the primary entry point of the criminal justice system. The, 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 national, the, the, the director of national pub, public prosecutions or the department of public prosecutions is secondary after a crime is committed and it goes to them. Now, all these years since I was in the police, they appointed the national, uh, the, the national director of public prosecutions with a pe person with the relevant qualifications and experience in certain instances. There were a couple of instances where they just put people there because they were, you know, some uh, willing, um, what you call it, uh, yeah. Uh, for, for useful certain... deployments, shall we put yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Useful, yeah. useful deployments, right. But uh, if you take uh, the latest uh, appointment, uh, Patoy, Shamila Patoy, 
uh, and the powers given to her, you know, uh, to appoint people to really, you know, um, uh, build the integrity of that institution and the capacity of that institution uh, to ensure successful prosecutions. Now, they won't actually um, do this particular experiment with, un they, won't, they, they won't put there a person with matric. They won't put there a person who's got a master's degree in uh, social, uh, social work. No. They won't put there a person, as I read in the papers, with a preschool uh, education diploma. They won't put it there. No, they won't. But that is the secondary function. But the primary function, like the police, they experiment with these people. Exactly. No, no. Exactly. Is there really a regard to the lives of our citizens? Uh, are they really serious when they do this? You know, that, policing, <laughs> policing is not a, a, yeah, a policing is not a scope, skit, and donor function. No, policing is a science. It's a science. Uh, you know, it's a profession. It's not like you a tracker driver. No, no, it's not preschool. But you will see they appoint, they appoint um, teachers in the police, but you can't take a policeman and make him a teacher. But right. everything has been tried and tested in the police. That's why we are sitting and finding ourselves where we are at this particular time. And you know what? It's difficult. You see how uh, Batoy, uh, Shamila Batoy struggled to get that institution to a level where it gained trust from the communities. Now, the, similarly, with um, the National Commissioner, he is the first after three uh, previous appointments with a fully fledged police officer. And, you know, and it's difficult to turn this Titanic around uh, on the right, uh, in the right direction. So why I'm saying this and why I'm participating when you people request me to do, I would like to make a contribution. Um, to, to, to explain to the people outside that we can do things much better. We don't have to be satisfied with what we have at this particular point in time. There are people with skills. Uh, people must just be identified and employed and allowed you know, to use their discretion and appoint not cadres, but officials, not politicians, but officials and people with the necessary qualifications and experience. Um, we, we hear this every time. Now we will re renew the government and all this, but nothing happens. Nothing happens. Exactly. It's the same and empty promises every cycle. Yeah, I mean, my time is gone in the police. I can play a different role uh, at a different level, for instance. But obviously I will make a contribution. You know, I gave, draft uh, operational reports to the Western Cape Premier to say, I've got a plan, use it. And they use it. It has been implemented without any expectation in return. Because I care for our people and I want South Africans to be safe. And whilst I can make a contribution, I will be first in line uh, because policing, is, is, it was my calling. It was not just a job for a salary, but it was the love uh, which I had to serve our people. And I was prepared to die for the cause um, to ensure that other people's lives uh, are safe. Well, General, I hope that when your PhD is done, that um, serious, serious, serious things uh, follow in its wake. And I think it will. I definitely think it will. Um, and... We would love to have you back on. Brian apologizes for not being here tonight. He actually has laryngitis and he can't speak. Um, so, so that's his excuse. But in, in about two weeks from now, um, let me actually, while I've got you on, on the air with everybody watching, no pressure, um, about uh, the 25th or so, around about then, of uh, 
July, if you're available, we'd love to have you back. And the audience can come with some questions again, and, and, and we'll, we'll definitely have something interesting to talk about, if you're keen. Yeah, it depends on the topic. I don't want to talk about the topic which I'm not <laughs> afraid with and don't have experience, but um, in the It'll line be of It'll something security, with policing and security, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. In, uh, if it is in line, okay, law as well. The limited knowledge I've got of law. Uh, but uh, but yes, I, I would love to make a contribution wherever I can. And um, yeah, I, you know, my wife said to uh, she, she normally says to me, when the people call me and ask uh, and, and share their problems and they want solutions and advice, <laughs> then um, then I do it. And she said, this, these people is abusing you, man. It's abusing you. You don't. If, if, if I've got a problem, you don't have time to listen to me. But if they've got a problem, they, you know, the thing is that instinct, that instinct, that instinct that they, I, am, I have to help somebody. There's somebody in need. I have to assist this person with, yeah. with his uh, problem. And once, if I can't resolve it, and I refer it to somebody else, and it has uh, been addressed, then I feel I have achieved something. I, exactly. I I I love I love somebody. You know, when I was I was I was um, uh, the MEC for community safety in the Western Cape, and uh, 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 a white person, a white guy, but uh, middle age, I I guess about sixty or fifty something, sixty. He called me, and he said to me, Minister, um, I've got a problem for seven years, for seven years. And the police can't uh, solve it. I said, okay, sir, uh, let me hear what is your problem. And he shared his problem. I said to him, but this is not a problem, man. This thing can be solved. And he said, I thought as much. I thought as much. I said, okay, leave it with me. And uh, <clears throat> and if the if the police didn't call you, attended to you uh, within two days, the day before tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, and then you you called me. They said, okay, took his number, everything. And I called uh, one general straight on, uh, who's also on retirement. I said to him, Raymond, you know, here's a problem. This gentleman struggled seven years and I shared the problem. He said to me, but uh, com com uh, commissaris, uh, this must be, it's what so long, man, I told this guy, I told this guy, this thing, something which we can solve. He said, okay, leave it with me. I said to him, Raymond, but please, uh, Revert to me after you address this issue. He said, that's fine. Raymond didn't call me back. And the next day, uh, my PA said to me, Minister, um, Mr. So-and-so, the same guy is on the line. I checked. Oh, man. Hey, the police dropped me, man. They dropped me. And uh, I said, okay, put him through. And he said to me, Minister Max, let me tell you. I had a bet on with a friend of mine. When I told him that this is my problem for seven years, he's, he bet me, he said, give that problem to Leonard Max. And I, if he can't resolve it, I, I, I buy you a whiskey. And if he resolve it, you owe me a whiskey. He said, I've lost my whiskey. <laughs> I, I owe the guy a whiskey. He said, my problem is solved. And he said to me, my friend had so much trust and confidence in you. And he said to me, I bet you Leonard Max will solve it. Now, Gideon. So I'm not going to bet whiskey against you because I'm just yeah, going to lose. <laughs> yeah, Gideon, it is good to receive, yeah, it is good to receive a salary. It's good. You have to look. But the, the most rewarding thing for me is, and was at that day, is for somebody who put the trust in me and I didn't disappoint. I changed the life of an individual. And it was worthwhile to go to office. And when I was police uh, general, I told the guys, when you put on your uniform and you say to your family, you go to work, go with the intention to change the life to the bear of the for the better for even if it is for one person, because that is what you take uh, took the oath for, and that is to serve and protect our people. 
general. That is a fantastic note with which to end. Thank you so much for, for spending nearly 10 minutes extra time with us. We're definitely having you on soon. You're always a hit. And thank you for bringing much needed perspective to what's been going on. I think much needed hope because there is an element of, of sanity, an element of control and an element of rationality uh, out there. And I think you've, you've managed to lay that out for the viewers and myself wonderfully tonight. So thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Always a pleasure, Gideon. And thank to the you. viewers, thank you for tuning in to us tonight. The General will be back. He's a firm favorite, and he's definitely coming back. And thank you for um, for everything Well, you guys have done, for the Super Chats, for just being here, for the likes, for the shares. Please go on to DRSA, have your say there. It's very important to all South Africans to, to be active citizens. And I'll see you soon. Lots of live streams next week. Stay uh, Follow the, the YouTube, the Facebook, and the Twitter, and uh, we'll be in touch. Have a good evening and stay safe.